Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our COVID-19 webinar series where we've been talking about the science and the stories around this pandemic. Thank you, Nicole, and all my colleagues for getting us set up here this Monday morning. I also want to recognize and thanks our partners, uh, Colorado School of Public Health, including Dr. John Samet, who've been really thoughtful colleagues all along the way in helping us put this series together. I also want to recognize that today is a very important holiday for our Jewish community. It is Yom Kippur, and while our Jewish friends cannot join today, I do wish them well. If you have missed any of our past recordings or this is your first time joining us, welcome. We have recordings of all of our previous episodes as well as written recaps. Just go to the Institute website, institute.dmns.org, and you can find all of that backlog information. If you're joining us on Zoom today, we want you to ask your questions in the chat feature. This is going to be a full on Q&A and conversation today, so feel free to start sending in your questions right away. We do our best to try to incorporate as many of those we can into the discussion, but we do not get to all your questions. So the chat feature right there where we, you've been letting us know where you've been watching from is where we'd encourage you to ask your questions. If you've joined us on Facebook Live this morning, hello over there. We also encourage you to ask questions on Facebook. You can use the comment feature to do that. Um, and we've got eyes on all these platforms, so we do see all your questions and we love to read them even if we can't get to all of them. So we are about six months into this pandemic and not just since the virus first came about, but really kind of since it's really upended a lot of people's lives and we've had shutdown and things have really changed. And so we thought we would spend today's episode talking about where we've come in the past six months with our collective knowledge and where do we go from here. So we're going to spend a little bit of time reflecting today on the field of public health, the speed at which research has been done, as well as the public trust in science. And then take that and think about, well, what does this mean for the road ahead? So I'm gonna spend about 40, 45 minutes with a really esteemed guest today, talking about some of these big picture les lessons and some of that forward thinking ideas about the state of our nation's healthcare. So this morning, I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Georges Benjamin. Dr. Georges Benjamin is known as one of the nation's most influential physician leaders. As executive director of the American Public Health Association since 2002, he is leading the association's push to make America the healthiest nation in one generation. Previously, he was the Secretary of Health in Maryland and also worked as the Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He is a graduate of the Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of Illinois Chicago, or excuse me, University of Illinois College of Medicine, board certified in internal medicine, and a fellow of the American College of Physicians, a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, a fellow emeritus of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health. Dr. Benjamin is extensively published, and as you can tell, very well accredited. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and also serves on the boards of many organizations, including Research America and the Reagan Uval Foundation. I find this quite interesting. In 2008, 2014, and 2016, he was named one of the top 25 minority executives in healthcare by Modern Healthcare Magazine. And in addition to being voted among the 100 most influential people in healthcare from 2007 to 2017. So we have a very established and high profile guest joining us today. And I am pleased to hopefully hear a lot of good information from him throughout the next 40 minutes. So good morning and welcome, Dr. Benjamin. How are you today? Kristen, good morning. Thanks for having me. Great. We're really excited to dive right in. And so this is going to be a straight up Q&A, like I said. So I actually want to start um, talking with you a little bit about public health in general. So something I realized we actually have never done, and I'm sure most of our audiences have a really good definition of this, but I would love if you could just talk to us a little bit about what is public health and what is its role in outbreak management. Sure. So let me just say that, you know, um, so I'm an ER doc. And I would love to think that my time in emergency medicine, I did health promotion, disease prevention, and I took care of sick people when they got injured or ill. Um, but what public health does, it does health promotion, disease prevention, and disease control. But we do that on a population basis. So we do it by the, you know, the, the, the fives, the tens, the millions, you know, the hundreds of millions. Um, so it, it's really done very much on a population basis. Um, 
and, and, and we do that through 10 essential services. So I'm going to um, share my screen here. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about this because this is a new refreshed, just rolled out a couple of weeks ago, 10 essential public health services. Um, and and for, those of you, so for those of you who don't recognize it or kind of recognize it because it's similar to the last one, but we do everything we do in public health through assessment by assessing the community, understanding what's going on, getting the data, monitoring population health, um, and investigating and diagnosing what's going on in the community. Um, it might start with a single case, but as you know, there's often, just like with COVID-19, becomes large numbers of cases. Um, and then we craft policy to address it. Um, policy programs, regulatory activities. Um, we, we search for solutions by communicating effectively to inform and educate, by um, trying to mobilize communities, getting political support, getting community support um, uh, to that. I'm gonna come back to that issue around politics in a moment. Um, creating champions to support the policies and procedures that we do. And we have re regulatory authorities. Um, and as you know, there's been a big debate in some communities about the public health regulatory authorities. Um, we, we have enormous police powers to try to put in place health protections. Um, we're very judicious in how we use those, but it's important to understand that public health um, can do some things to enforce the authorities that we have. Um, and then assurance, you know, at the end of the day, if it, if it um, asking that it gets done and having a policy that it gets done doesn't mean that it gets done, unless you do some things that um, assure that they happen, um, to try to build um, a diverse workforce because equity is at the center of everything we do in public health, um, doing the research and quality improvement so we understand what we're doing. So public health does a fair amount of research um, and build and maintain um, an infrastructure for public health. You know, by the way, that's in many ways that's failed us. Now on the policy front, let me just remind folks that those of you who are very familiar with the, the very, very famous story of Jon Snow who in order to, um, in 1800, in order to, to quell a cholera outbreak before we really understood um, even the biological basis of disease, of infectious diseases, was able to convince the city leaders to take the pump handle off the pump where he thought people were getting contaminated water to drink. Now, he did not sneak off in the middle of the night with a wrench and take the handle off. He had to convince the city leaders to do that. And one of the more interesting things, he was able to do that in a very religious time by convincing one of the religious leaders to support his position. So in many ways, he did everything in these 10 essential services um, by assessing and understanding what was going on, the stick pins that we all remember from those of us who had public health school and public health classes, he thought about what he had to do from a policy perspective, i.e. Um, he had to figure out how he got them to basically pass a referendum that you couldn't drink from the water. And then he actually made sure the pump handle came off. So just pointing out that politics does play a role in everything that we do because we do policy, but we do it through science and not because we, we're pushing politics because we're trying to push science as a way of getting things done. So with that, um, let me stop and just point out the final thing is that public health, often, we often say that our best work is done when nothing happens. Um, and that's our goal. Our goal is to prevent things from happening in the first place or to mitigate them in such a way that you forget that they happened in the first place. That's great. So let's build a little bit on that and just unpack that a little bit more about policy versus politics and the role of public health within that. And what often seems at times things that have become politicized. Um, what, you know what I mean? As someone who works intimately in both of those spaces, what are some things that have become politicized that you don't think have become, should have become politicized? And what is, what are role, our role, your role um, in helping to prevent some of that politicization? Yeah, let me talk about two things. Let me talk about masks 
let me talk about the false choice between the economy and public health. Um, and then we, we, we can eventually talk about vaccines, I'm sure. So masks, you know, traditional wisdom was that um, the masks would not protect us, um, the broad public in a droplet-like infection, um, which is the primary mode we think that COVID is, is passed, at least that still is, is, is the prevailing view, even though aerosolization does play a role. And fomite transmission, meaning getting it from touching a surface that's in, infected does play a role. Um, and that's because, you know, your mask doesn't fit tightly around your face. Um, I have my, um, my APHA mask, my APHA Speak for Health mask, and just remind folks that, you know, it's here and it, um, you know, it, it, it lifts up, I breathe around it. And we believe that those masks would not protect us as much. And so initially we told people that masks, yeah, we ought to save the masks. We put my primary talking about the N95 masks, a really tight mask that healthcare providers needed to use. We were trying to preserve those because we didn't know, we, we knew we didn't have enough. And we didn't think the paper mask or the cloth mask would be that effective. Turns out, that a lot of study has been done since then. And it turns out the masks are highly effective um, for this disease in particular. And, you know, the, it got politicized early. It became a um, um, blue state, red state argument. It became a, I believe in COVID versus I don't believe in COVID argument. It, it was, um, it came out very early as you told us one thing and you told us something different. And that was just very, very poor risk communication. Um, we started with what we thought we knew about mask wearing and this disease. We also did that in the context of not understanding the, the percent in which this disease was passed asymptomatically. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if everyone who gives you the disease is symptomatic, then um, you, can, you, can, you can stay away from people that are symptomatic and they can stay away from you. But it turns out as much as 40% of the people who um, um, can be infected can pass it along asymptomatically, or people who are infected pass it along asymptomatically. So that changes the ball game, and that makes the mask even more important. So that was the first one that got politicized. The second thing was this false of dichotomy that the economy um, has to be preserved at all costs um, and that health is not as important. Um, initially, it was health was very important, and the economy doesn't need to be preserved, but health is more important. We can have both, but the secret to preserving the economy is to protecting our health. And um, I remind people that health is 18% of the gross domestic product of this country. So we are already into the economics uh, of the country by virtue of the fact that we have a big health system. Um, and the best way for us to get out of this pandemic is to focus like a laser on the health stuff and the economy will follow. Let's start, go back to that kind of first point you were talking about a little bit with the communication. Um, you know, so information um, was coming out very rapidly and I think people were expecting everyone to have the answer right at the beginning, of course, which we didn't. Um, not only did science unfold and, and is still unfolding in real time and very rapidly, information is coming out very rapidly. Information is changing. What are some ways that we could be doing this better as far as communicating in this at sometimes very uncertain space? Um, who, who has that authority? Who where have you seen really good communication coming out? And what should our audience be looking to when they're trying to find answers in sometimes where there's not really solid answers? Well, clearly in political leaders, um, the governor of Ohio and uh, the mayor of New York have been two exemplars in terms of good communication, um, including his health secretary in Ohio. Um, um, she was doing an incredible job of effectively communicating to the public. Um, I think that in terms of, of health leaders, obviously, Tony Fauci um, is the gold standard uh, um, in terms of uh, telling us what he knows. Um, in the old days, which was not too long ago, we used to have daily briefings in crises like this for infectious diseases from the CDC. 
Um, and they would come up every day and they would say, look, this is what we know today. They would remind us each and every time that this is a new disease that we've not seen before. They would remind the public, because we forget. Very, very quickly, we forget these things. And, um, and yeah, we learned something new today. You know, um, and here's why we're changing what we told you. And here's why we're changing what we told you. So that people get a sense that we're not, you know, um, shooting from the hip, that we have a rational reason for doing something. Now, people may still have the right to disagree, you know, but they don't have the right to be disagreeable about it. And they may, they should argue their perspectives. Um, but, but that's what's not happening. Very, CDC is putting a lot of really good science guidance on their website, but it's kind of being snuck on the website, it's kind of just being posted. Normally they would say, okay, here's, what's, here's what we think and here's why we think it. And sometimes that public debate results in changing the guidance and that's good. But unless you know why they were saying what they're saying or having them explain the intricacies of the details because the devil is in the details of all this science stuff. And a lot of it is, yes, this is what we mean unless we mean this or unless this happens. Um, and that's very, very important. And that's not happening right now. Yeah, one of our guests was asking about um, the legitimacy of information, right, that gets put on these websites. Could you speak to the legitimacy um, of information coming out from, you know, HHS and, and other government agencies? And, and I'm assuming, you know what I mean, when we see our experts, when we see our leaders, when we see guidance coming out from institutions, um, you know what I mean? Those are the trusted sources that we need to during this pandemic. I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about people's questioning legitimacy. Yeah, well, most of the information they put up there is pretty good information, but unless it's been messed with by people that don't know what they're talking about. And, and, and what's happening is um, there have been several very, very public meddlings in the information that's put up. Um, the CDC has a very good process to vet information before it goes up. I mean, quite frankly, a lot of us often complain that um, it is sometimes too perfect, you know, and it, it sometimes um, takes too long and they're often far too cautious when they put information up, but they have a process that they trust and, um, and several eyes get on the information. Anyone who's ever written anything knows that when you've written the perfect essay and then you give it to someone else to read and they find all the mistakes that you made, knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, I just did that with a, a blog I wrote the other day. It was beautiful. It was masterfully written until the copy editors got their hands on it. And, you know, I, I have a tendency when I type to misspell the word health, I, re I, I, I transpose the, e, the A and the L all the time. By the way, the, 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 the spell checkers doesn't catch that. Um, I, you, you leave out words, you leave out verbs every now and then, pronouns every now and then. Um, and sometimes you leave out whole lines of thought because you're typing, you're writing, and your brain is moving faster than your fingers. So yes. And then when you read it, of course, your, your brain picks up what you thought you said there. So I think that's a challenge. Um, um, and in having um, these kinds of things and not having a process. And what's happened is we've had people who have had motives other than the purity of informing the public in a, in a science-based way, um, interfering in the process. And that's, that's why we, we, we're beginning to lose trust um, in those institutions. Let me just say, we need to stand behind those institutions. We need to push back against these, um, um, these uninformed voices uh, and actions, and and support uh, the the folks the the, the folks that want to do this right. Um, if if we're really going to save lives and prevent prevent disease. I don't know if people could see me, but I was chuckling and nodding, nodding when you were talking about the brain writing things that you thought were actually coming out in black and white. I was happens to me all the time. I'm like I. I read it in my writing. Anyways, let's, let's stay on top of here, but I, I, I'm sure many of us agree with you when it comes to that. 
So let's talk a little bit about kind of where we are, maybe like what has gone right and what has gone wrong. Um, so let's start there and, and say, actually step back even further there. And what is, what is one big thing that has surprised you since we kind of really have been tackling this for the past six months? Yeah. So let, let, me, let, me, let me say that, that um, the science enterprise um, has, has gone generally well. I mean, the, the scientists behind the scenes that are working on the studies on vaccines that even though we had the, the initial failure on the testing, um, there's been a lot of, of new, real interesting innovations that have happened um, that I think have been really kind of neat. Um, I think the biggest thing that surprised me was not that I, that I didn't know these disparities would, would be terrible um, and that they occur with every new disease, but these health inequities have been so profound even I was, I was surprised at the degree of illness and injury that has occurred from COVID in communities of color. Um, I was one of the early people that said, listen, we need to get our hands around this. This is back in the end of, um, um, of February, early March, right after this thing happened, when we saw some early reports coming out of China that people with chronic disease, um, if they got infected, got sicker. Um, and that surprised me. Um, I think the, the, the work of the, the medical care community, um, the learnings that we've learned about how to manage this disease, particularly in terms of airway and ventilator management, we've made profound um, um, understandings there and improvements in our, in our clinical practice. We've also, um, you know, the public health folks have been working like a dog. They have not gotten credit for the work that they have done around containing the disease um, by any means. Uh, and that, that certainly um, uh, is, is very, very important. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the work that they've done. But, you know, when, you're, when your hands are tied and you're not getting the information that you need and the technology you're left with to share information are fax machines in an environment where social media can share information or misinformation, and sometimes disinformation um, at the speed of an electron, and you're sharing information with fax machines, we got a problem. Yeah. What about, okay, so stay with the um, disparities, inequities, and the disproportionate impacts on communities of color. Um, what are some specific things that have been done to try to decrease um, these effects on the Black, Latino, and other communities of color that have been seeing disproportionate impacts? And, and are there differences in treatments being developed for them? Yeah. So, we, so we know the reasons for, for um, um, the higher numbers. Really three, three and I shouldn't be surprised to anybody. Um, um, the fact that many of these individuals are, are public facing. So I can, I can, I can tell where from home, you know, all the, all the white collar workers that um, have computers can telework from home, um, that's great. But bus drivers, transportation workers, highly impacted, meat, work, meat plant workers, uh, people who work in poultry farms, uh, folks that are at grocery stores, those folks are out and about, um, the people that pick up a trash every day. The essential workers are much more likely to get exposed by a disease where you get it person to person. Secondly, um, a lot of um, delays in actually sheltering in place, even for those people that could shelter in place, um, because of, of the fact that early on there was this, lots of terrible rumors about the fact that uh, African Americans, for example, were immune from this disease um, that was going through social media or mis misunderstandings of how you got the disease. Um, delays in testing, you know, I think we all marveled when we did the drive through testing sites. We knew we were short on tests. But remind yourself that when you, this initially happened, we were testing people based on their, whether they were sick or not. If you didn't have a car and you're not well, taking a train and a couple buses and then walking a few blocks to go get tested wasn't an option. And, and if you didn't have a car, sometimes getting a test was not an option. So that, the, the structure of our early testing activities um, were desperate in their very nature. And we should have known better. Now, what has happened to try to fix some of that? Well, absolutely. 
there have been efforts to move testing into communities of color, into lower income communities. Um, we've always known you have to open up the testing sites um, on weekends and after hours. We have to acknowledge people. Many of the people that are at highest risk are, are shift workers. Um, and so we have to make it more available. So communities that have done that um, tend to have better access to testing than communities that have it. Now that testing has rolled out in a much more advanced way. Um, I think there was a, a lot of work done by the healthcare community to figure out how to share resources. Um, the downside is they shouldn't have had to do that. That should have been led it much more assertively at the federal level. Um, buying equipment. We shouldn't have had states bidding against one another for equipment and supplies. Um, they weren't designed to do that. We could have done that at the national level much more effectively than we did. Um, I understand there was re reluctance of the federal government to get in that space, um, but that was, that was um, ill-conceived um, thinking, I believe, on the part of the federal government. And I think not having a unified voice, um, that, that's a real problem um, in, in, in part of this. Now, there are lots of tests out there, and um, like in any disaster response, they're never perfect, but we had a blueprint that was left um, for the new administration, which they did not follow. And then um, the lack of any real written plan. One of the reasons for planning is to, um, to field test, you know, ideas. People get into a room and they, they throw ideas on a piece of paper and they talk about them and they fight over them, they argue over them, they, they trade ideas, and then they come out with a plan. And then they implement that plan and the plan kind of works, but then they have to update it along the way. But a plan gives you a way uh, and a blueprint so everybody can see themselves in it and know what their roles are. And, and that didn't happen um, in an effective way with this, with this pandemic. Um, and quite frankly, that's why we have over 7 million cases and over 200,000 people have died because we really have not approached this with the thoughtful enterprise that it is. That, that it should have been. Let's dig in a little bit to um, supplies, supply chain, supply lines that you were hinting at for testing, because I know this is going to come up to play when we talk about vaccines too. Um, so where are some weaknesses that we currently have in supplies? You know, it seems like testing is moving in that right direction, if not, you know what I mean, really achieving what we need for it yeah. for right now. But where, where are we still struggling when it comes to supplies and being prepared for deployment of a vaccine? Well, you know, I, you know, I, the, there, there, there are certainly things that the administration has done um, um, a little late, but, but better. Um, obviously, the, trying to ramp up testing, we're still nowhere, we're near where we need to be. But, but they, you know, they got on top of that and they began to, to push that out very differently than, than, um, than we did when we started up. Um, I think that um, at the end of the day, um, we don't have to wait for um, a new administration, the next administration to get started. I mean, we know what we have to do to do this. This is not rocket science. This is basic public health practice that we know works. Um, and as, we, as we're thinking about this, um, we, can, we can turn the corner today and begin to do things in the manner that we know works, the science-based evidence, stop undermining science, put CDC out there in a the lead, un unbridle them, let them give us press conferences every day, stop being afraid of what they're going to say in terms of the impact that it'll have on the economy of the stock market. Um, the stock market is quite resilient. You know, the stock market folds if somebody sneezes. Um, they, they, there's all, you can never predict what the smart stock market is going to do. But the faster we get our hands around this epidemic, the faster we're going to be able to, you know, return to as near normal a state as possible. We ought to talk about the fact that we're never going to be like it was a year ago. So, I mean, what is your projection, right? You know what I mean? I mean, we are shifting into, um, you know, quote unquote, a new normal, but there is no normal again. But, you know, yeah. COVID, when do, when do you think we're going to get our hands around to a place where 
you know what I mean? Right now, there's still restrictions on shutdown at various level degrees from the local to the state to other levels, right? So, I mean, in the next six months from now, the next 12 months from now, right? What does that start to look like for you where people can start to feel like COVID isn't front and center to so much of their activities and day-to-day -day life? What does that look like? Yeah, I, so I do think that the vaccine is a game changer in terms of, of changing the way we approach this um, and function in our daily lives. Um, let, me, let me talk about what we need to do this fall. First this fall, we have to we have to recognize that we're about to get hit with the annual return of influenza. And so uh, the, good, the good news is, is that wearing a mask, washing your hands and keeping your distance is also a good strategy for influenza. Um, and so many of the things that we're doing for COVID will help us reduce the impact of influenza. And in fact, that has been the experience of the Southern Hemisphere um, where they had a, a relatively light influenza season, but only because they did all of those things, plus they had flu shots. So people should get their flu shot. Um, it helps with, from a clinical perspective with a differential diagnosis. Um, that does not mean that they still may not test you for flu and test you for COVID, but it's helpful not to have, um, the, to deal with the symptoms that are similar with two diseases. Because if you had the flu, um, if you had the flu shot, that means that you're much more likely to have something else. It may not be COVID, but you have something else that has an influenza-like disease presentation. Um, and so that would help us um, deal with these two outbreaks that may continue in the fall with COVID and then be superimposed with, with uh, influenza. Once we know we have a vaccine that's safe and effective, I um, want to remind you that we've not done any studies in kids yet. So this is going to be an adult discussion for a while. Then um, we'll start giving people vaccinations um, in a prioritized way for COVID-19. And it'll be this time next year, we'll still be wearing masks, washing our hands, keeping our distance at some degree, and hopefully getting vaccinated. So next year's return to school and return to sports should be very different, but still measured um, next year. Um, APHA, we're hoping to have our annual meeting. By the way, we're hoping to have our annual meeting there in Denver. Um, and we know there's going to be a hybrid meeting. We know that we'll have people there. At least we're anticipating having people there face to face. But we also know that we'll have a virtual um, component to our meeting as well. Um, and so we're going to be doing that. And we're going to, of course, encourage mask wearing and hand washing and physical distancing and all those kinds of things because um, and, and by the way, we'll be really pushing people getting their flu shot before they come for that very reason. So I had a great question here. This is going to be slightly out of right field, but um, I think it's, it's a good question from one of our audience members that um, even though we've drawn from the WHO, the World Health Organization, how much are we still working with other countries on vaccines and, and other COVID related things? So it turns out that the scientists um, are um, ignoring the politicians and are still working um, behind the scenes together. We're still working with China. We're still working with the World Health Organization and, um, and other nations. Um, there are still lots of conversations that are occurring around the world. Scientists are sharing their information through, the, you know, through journals, through um, a range of backdoor channels. And um, we're kind of just saying, you know, ignoring the politicians quite frankly, um, who I think are becoming, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are, are becoming um, obstructionists to this process and our eroding trust. Um, but to the extent that we can continue to work with our colleagues around the world, um, you know, scientists rock. So um, I, this person specifically asked about vaccines and we have a ton coming in about vaccines. We actually had Dr. Hotez um, on our last episode talking about vaccines and, and a little bit specific level. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about vaccines too, because it is really front and center. I mean, I was reading about um, China this weekend um, pushing out a vaccine to a lot of people. And we know we're in phase three trials for a number of contenders here in the US, especially around the world as well too. So a couple things regarding vaccines. Um, I'd love if you could talk to 
um, what is the emergency use authorization and how that might be used to deploy a vaccine, as well as what are some of um, your thoughts to a really well planned and well communicated vaccine program. So the, the emergency use authorization allows you to use a medication, quote unquote, off label before it has gone through the full process of the Food and Drug Administration's um, regulatory aspects. It means that they are in effect accepting the uh, word of the pharmaceutical company that they have done all the right things to ensure that a drug is safe and effective. Um, it's often used when the paperwork is going in and all of the I's have not been dotted and T's crossed around understanding all of the science around the um, um, regulatory process, um, all the committee meetings have not been held. Um, I think the concern, of course, is that that will be used uh, as a way of accelerating bringing the vaccine um, to use. And it may very well be that it's okay once we have enough data and the scientists have looked at the studies and say, yep, that, that data is okay. And so now we're going to expand the use of this um, vaccine to a broader group of people for purposes of, of you know, getting the process started and getting people, getting some population protected. Um, but, you know, the best way to do this is of course to, to finish all the vaccine trials and make sure that, um, the trials have been done as designed and they're answering all the questions that at least initial designs of the you know, studies were designed to answer. Um, safe and effective means that it, um, elicit, the vaccine elicits an immune response. And by the way, the early studies show that it does elicit an immune response. Um, and then that the complications um, uh, are the, 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 the benefits dramatically outweigh the complications um, of vaccines, of, of any individual vaccine. You know, a, a, a sore shoulder or a little bruising um, is, is generally viewed as not a, not a serious problem. Um, something that causes severe neurological disease, um, either early or late in the process, will be a much more serious complication, as, as I'm sure Dr. Hotes pointed out. Um, so what we're hoping is that, that the process that we go through, that EUA is not used as a way of undermining the research studies, but as a way of accelerating access to the vaccine that has been shown to be safe and effective. Thank you for that. So um, we have an interesting question here that um, I think may kind of start to head us into wrapping up this conversation, because um, I would like to ask it and have you unpack it. So we had one of our guests who um, suggested that um, by looking at the stats and kind of the high number of infections we have in our com country compared to other countries around the world, the high death rate we have, the high per capita death rate, it appears that we're maybe kind of in last place globally when it comes to our response in the pandemic. And so how would you rate our response so far? And I'm actually gonna put a number <laughs> scale on this between one to 10. How would you rate our response so far? And then depending on how you rate that, why? And then how do we get to a little bit of a, you know what I mean, in the next stages of our response? How do we increase that to what I'm gonna hope is like a higher response rate? So let me just point out that prior to we were, you know, as, as they looked at all the nations in the world, there were all the, 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 the response systems were rated and we were rated at the top. Now, by the way, all the systems were not rated really well. We all were had, had problems, but we were rated at the top. And I think we, we have clearly shown that our performance is near the bottom. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, you know, we're somewhere around a three. Um, and how do we get to be 10? We get to be 10 by having a unified national voice um, responding in a, you know, putting together a strategic plan, both to manage this outbreak, to do testing, to make sure we have equipment in place, follow that plan, remodel it as necessary, 
um, allow the scientists to um, and medical personnel to talk to the American people, frankly, um, to provide the political leadership um, that this um, outbreak deserves in a way that does not undermine the science. And, um, and we're going to put more money on the table. I understand it's going to require more money. And then as we look forward, we're going to have to build a public health system um, that we can truly be proud of, that can identify any time a new threat enters the community. So remember that, that we were all worried about COVID-19, um, but we just went through Zika and SARS-1 and Ebola. We had an opioid epidemic, by the way, has not gone away, it's gotten a little worse. Um, an obesity epidemic, which has not gone away and has gotten a little worse. Um, and, and the opioid and obesity epidemic resulted in almost three years of reductions in life expectancy in this country. Um, so we have to make sure that we understand that, that this idea of having a public health system where um, our best work occurs, nothing happens, would be us getting to the tent um, and knowing very quickly when a health threat enters the community by once and for all investing more of our resources and engagement in public health, doing a better job of educating our political leaders so that they don't see the health department staff, um, that they, they treat them like they treat with respect their police chiefs and fire chiefs. Um, when, a, when, a, when your chief of police comes and tells you something, most political leaders pay attention to it. When the fire chief comes and tells you something, they don't question their, their ability to manage the fire. But we're having far too many political leaders that are undermining and questioning the judgment of their public health folks. Um, and I think that's, that's unfortunate. Um, um, and they're not, you know, they're not, not you know, and I, I have to admit, some of them are not standing behind them when they go through these, they're getting all these threats from the public. Um, you know, when I speak to you, I'm speaking to you as your doctor, um, as your public health person. And if you're not a, a physician, great. If you're a public health person that's not a physician, great. You're speaking to them in your role as a good nurse, um, as a good person with a master's in public health, but you're doing it based on trying to protect their health and not, you're not telling this based on politics. Well, let's have one final thought then on the public. I know scientific literacy, public engagement in general and education is important to the association. Um, so what, what more could we be doing to become a more literate um, public when it comes to some of the science? Yeah, we just, there's some studies that have been done through Research America whose board I said and the average American can't name a, a living scientist, nor say where science is done. Well, let me just tell you, science is done in your academic health centers, in your communities, it's done at your museums, it's done in your, um, in your health departments, um, it's done in your doctor's office, um, and the scientists in your community are your neighbors um, that, that do that. They're the doctors and nurses, and they're the chemists, and they're the biologists, that work every day asking these questions. So when someone asks you, work, work, you know, who does science in your community, name one of those places. And if it's the museum, that's, that's a great place to start. Um, I grew up living in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago as a kid. Uh, I, I practically lived in that building. Um, and um, if you wanna know who a scientist is um, and you can't name at least one, um, living scientists, um, please give the name Tony Fauci. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. George is Benjamin as well. So. <laughs> oh, 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 and my good friend Jonathan Salmon too. Oh yeah, Dr. D. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, everyone should hopefully have gotten to know his name who's tuned in so far. He's joined us at least, I think, for three now. Um, so he's definitely been um, one of our local leaders here in the state of Colorado. And I'm extremely appreciative for him for introducing me to you and having you join us today. I am so thankful and grateful for your time and for your expertise and for sharing the past 45 minutes with us. So thank you and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Kristen, thank you and thank you for having me with you today.
It's been great. Thank you to our audience today. You all had a wonderful set of questions. Um, hopefully we got a few of them dressed, but not all of them. Um, just a friendly reminder, we do have these recordings available as well as written recaps. If you're not a person to sit and rewatch a whole video um, on our Institute website, just go to institute.dmns.org. You can find today's once that comes up at about 24 to 48 hours, as well as all of our other previous recordings and written recaps. Um, so as a reminder, we are now down to an every other week schedule with this series. So we're off next Monday and then we'll be back on October 12th. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to build on today's conversation and we're going to take it and bring it back a little bit locally and kind of have a little bit of a similar thing of talking about six months in, but where are we as a state of Colorado? So a little bit more here, uh, focus on the state of Colorado, even though I know we have audiences from all over the U.S. joining us. Um, so that's what you can expect for October 12th, 8.30 a.m. Mountain Time um, on that Monday. Um, make sure you're on our mailing list. And I think Nicole is going to drop in all of our Twitter handles so you can follow us on social media, if you will, too. I hope you have a great rest of your week and, and thank you for joining us.